Hey everyone, it's Maggie Bot, and today I decided to do a little bit of something um, different, and that is to go a little bit into my feelings on Ponzi Scheme. Ponzi Scheme is a uh, three to five player uh, trading game, sort of, from uh, Homeo Sapiens Lab. It will be out in the States this winter from Taste of Menstrual Games. And unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of reviews or discussion about it going on, so I thought I might take a shot at it. We'll see how this goes. Um, I find this game to be really thrilling. Um, it's about 45 minutes long. It works perfectly as a after a game night game. Uh, it works on its own to a certain extent at like conventions or things where you maybe just have a bunch of random people in a group. Um, it might even be a little bit better as a con game, and I know a lot of people will say that, but it worked in our group pretty well. We, we had a lot of fun learning it. Um, the trading in the game is all secrets, right? You are trading secrets with other players at the board using what I like to refer to as this little checkbook-looking thing. Um, the way it works is that I want a tile from you and you want a tile from me because these are victory points at the end of the game, especially if you can get multiples of the same color. So, you pick out someone else at the table who has the same color bit as you, and you put a number of dollars into this hidden envelope no one else can see, and you hand it to that player and you say, I want your blue industry, please. They take a look at the money, and they have two options. They can either just hand their piece to you that you've asked for and take the money, or they can match the money in the envelope, hand it back to you, and then you give them your tile. So you're putting kind of this relative value on these tiles, trying to get people to buy or sell them at, like you want, because you need money for interests and all the loans that you're racking up, but you also need these tiles for points. Um, it makes for a really cool dynamic game, trying to figure out what people value what tiles at, um, especially because they're triangle scoring, so one tile is worth one, but two is worth three, and three is worth six, and four is worth ten. So the more of a given tile you have, the more expensive trying to get more of those tiles tends to be, and that's part of the, the big fun of it, right? Um, it also comes with these kind of outlandish bits, this little envelope. The player screens are like silly chunky, they're crazy thick. Um, it comes with paper money, better or worse, I think it works really well in this game. And this version comes with this, like, wooden cube to put all the money in, like, to keep as a bank. I'm not sure it was necessary, but it's pretty adorable. Um, the art is nothing to... I mean, it's it's fine. I think it fits the game pretty well. Um, you have cards with bears, cards without bears. And the bears force the, the game to trick players or um, it'll further along the game without people realizing it's going to happen. It's the one kind of stock market part of this, like the randomness that all players have to deal with, which I find to be really, really fascinating. Um, I love trying to figure out what other people are doing and there is one universal truth of it all. Um, if one player decides to take a bear loan, um, to try and take the bears out of the market or whatever they're trying to do. It's the most money, the worst interest. Um, they tend to come up every three turns instead of every four or five turns. Bears can make this game super, super fun. Um, if only one person takes a bear, though, that person's probably going to lose. But if multiple people take bears, they will probably further the game enough where the risk-averse player will lose. And I find that to be a lot of fun as well. Trying to negotiate people into taking those bears or avoiding them. Um, trying to play to your strengths. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, we as a group have decided not to value most money at the end of the game. We use the luxury items that were included. These are a one-time payment for one, two, three, or four victory points. And the more victory points you're buying, the more expensive that is. But that's money being taken out of the game that you can't pay loans with. Um, so it's a very interesting mechanic to me, and it reminded me of Greed Inc., because they do kind of all of your victory points in Greed Inc. are those luxury goods. And so I find that to be very interesting. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more about the game, and then you can decide for yourself. Phase one is the funding phase. In the funding phase, you're going to be able to take a loan and a corresponding industry tile based on the number of tiles that you have. So if it's the second tile I have of a color, so my second yellow, I would be able to take from the second row here. So I can take any one of these. The way that these are lined up is that the three lowest cards are at the top, the three middle cards are in the middle, and the three highest cards are at the bottom. 
If I already have three of a given color, I can't take a fourth one and I don't have access to any of this. So let's say I want this $51. As you can see, it will have me own $95 every four turns. So $51 goes to my personal bank. This gets added to the four section of my wheel. In four turns, I will owe $95 and $11. In three turns, $12. In four turns, $13. The next phase is that clandestine trade phase. So in the clandestine trade phase, I spy another player who has a similar color industry tile as me, and I would like that tile. I then will identify some amount of money to put into this envelope. So let's say I put $20 in. This is kind of unrealistic because the third tile is probably going to cost more than $20. But then I hand that to the player and I say, I would like your yellow tile. That player evaluates whether or not to just hand me the tile and take the cash. Or they could put $20 more into the envelope. I take the envelope back and they get my tile. The cash goes from here behind the screen without any of the other players knowing quite what was done. Every player gets one chance at the clandestine trading phase as long as they have some industry tiles in front of them because you do have to trade only with someone that has a like color with you. Then you're going to pass the first player marker to the next player. Then we're going to do a market crash phase. The way market crash phase works is that the player who is the new first player gets to choose one of the cards out on the display to remove from the board permanently. So maybe I want one of these dinky ones from the beginning taken away and I add a new card to the board. I rejigger it so that the lowest, medium, and high are still true. And then we check for a market crash. So the market crashes are looking for these bear cards. Bear cards, if there are as many bear cards as players playing, you're going to remove them all from the board. And instead of your wheel moving once that round, it's gonna move twice. Luckily, we don't have that many bears, so we are just going to move the wheel one spot. So that moves one spot this way. And now you can see I've got one more turn before I pay 13, two more turns before I pay 12, and in three turns I owe $106. So I've got to really work on making sure I've got enough cash behind my screen to be able to cover that. After that, anyone that has any cards in front of this red arrow need to pay their interest. And after that's done, those cards will reset. So if I was paying this interest, then it would go back to the four spot, and in four more turns I would have to see it again and repay that interest. So now you saw that kind of how the regular turn order works. Um, it's really important to note that the clandestine trading is the bulk of the game. That's where most of your really interesting decisions and fun parts of the game happen, as well as removing that uh, card from the market during the market crash phase. Um, because if you can see, maybe there are three players and you can see two bears, Maybe I remove a non-bear card to try and get the market to crash, because if people aren't ready for it, that's what ends the game, is if someone can't pay the interest they owe. In a market crash, any cards that the red arrow touches are going to come due and get reset. So if people were planning on having one more round before something really big came up, they wouldn't have that round to prepare. Um, it has led to some of the most funny things in the, all of the games I've played. All right, y'all, you saw a little bit of the gameplay as I showed you. I really hope you give this a chance this winter. It'll be out from Tasty Minstrel in stores, in retail, very, very available. When it first happened at Essen, people were getting like $100 to $200 offers online for the game. But I'm a little afraid that once it's available and everyone can get it, that that buzz will die off. It is super, super worth it. One of my favorite, favorite games from last winter, and I really love it. Um, I encourage you all to try it. If you find me at a con and there's a copy, I will totally play it with you. I feel like at BGG Con this year, this will be a big, big thing because it'll be so much easier to get by then that it, it should go into one of those like con always games. But for us and my group, it also worked for our game nights. It was a fun one to bust out at the end of a night or right before the big game started. It's short. It's blessedly short, like 40, 45 minutes. The box says an hour to an hour and a half. So I guess if you're taking it very seriously and mulling over all your options, I guess it could take that long. I guess the one criticism I'll have with the game, and this will depend on your group as well, um, three and four players, it works beautifully. I've not had any trouble with it. At five players, there are some incidences where if people don't like the way you're trading, 
or they don't like your pricing or they don't like how you're doing in the game, they can just avoid trading with you. There's no, there's no um, set rules to who you can pass the envelopes to as long as they have a tile, an industry tile in like with you. Um, so at five players, I have noticed that it would be me or someone else or maybe two players just not getting traded with that often. And they would often be uh, starved for tiles. So they'd have to make these kind of outlandish deals to try and get back into the, the mix of things. And those are usually not to their advantage. So I found that to be uh, just a little bit off in the five player. So that's that's me and that's my opinion. Um, I'm not sure if Tasty Minstrel is changing any of the rules. Uh, if they are, I can't imagine what they would change. It's also clean right now. Uh, the Windrose mechanic, it's really nice to have another game use the Windrose because you don't see that very often, not since Macau. And I just love it so much. I hope it does really well. And if you have questions or anything else, please put them down below. Um, and again, love to thank everyone on my Patreon for helping make this channel possible. We are definitely going through some changes. I hope you liked a little bit of the interviews. I'm trying to get some more of the Gen Con footage worked into something viewable and fun. I had a blast, but I don't know if it shows. <laughs> um, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.